Okay, we have started the recording. Welcome everyone to our November 28 webcast. This webcast is the Sensational Award Winners Part 1 Licensure Program. And the reason that we're doing uh, just, um, we're doing two uh, Sensational Award Winner webcasts is because we had a record number of submissions for Sensational Awards this year. Really great work by our members. And also we um, had a record number of winners. We had three categories and our three categories, as you all may know, uh, one is licensure programs. We're going to cover that today. And we're also going to, in January, invite our award winners from the location um, section and also in our in innovations, which is a broader category um, about different programs that are implemented at the institutions. So we're very excited that we're able to share with you our two winners for licensure programs today. So as you can see here, we are going to um, go through our presentations today. We will take questions at the end of our um, webcast and the handouts are available. If you would like to pull up the PowerPoint, it is under handouts. You'll see that in your um, dashboard and it indicates handouts one of five and that is the PDF of the PowerPoint for today. As I mentioned, we'll be taking questions today, but first we're going to go through each of the presentations. We have two different groups of presenters. As I mentioned, two of our award winners are here to our institutions, and uh, they will be sharing their good work, and then we will take questions at the end so that we can make sure and get through both of the presentations. Please don't worry. If we do not get to your question at the end of the session, we will be able to keep your questions as they will be located in the question box, and we'll be able to um, bank those and share those with the presenters to get answers to your questions. Moderators for today, I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network and along with me is Dan Silverman, the assistant director for the State Authorization Network. Hi everybody. <laughs> and we're happy to have Dan here. Hi Dan. And uh, so as we see our presenters are here, we have the University of Phoenix and we have Mount St. Mary's University. And with um, the University of Phoenix, we have uh, Bridget Beville. Um, Bridget is a regulatory lawyer with a focus on higher education law and policy. She has spent the last 13 years at the University of Phoenix, starting as an associate faculty in law and ethics and moving into roles in both university legal services and government affairs. In her current role, she serves as the university's primary legal advisor on SARA policies and procedures, state authorization and distance education, as well as licensure programs. Bridget worked with a team of cross-functional leaders to implement SARA in Arizona, including formation of the Arizona SARA Council. She has also worked with state higher education regulatory authorities across the country and is familiar with local and online regulatory schemes in several states. Before working for the university, Bridget practiced law in Texas for eight years, including stints at both the Hidalgo uh, County District Attorney's Office and the El Paso County Attorney's Office, and was appointed an associate municipal judge for the city of El Paso. She holds an, an undergraduate degree in Spanish from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and law degree from St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. We're very pleased to have uh, Bridget with us today. And also from Mount St. Mary's, we have uh, two, two members. Um, we have Kiris Grimes, who began her state authorization journey as a graduate assistant in 2015 and began working as the office of the, at the Office of the Provost Coordinator in 2016 after obtaining her master's degree in higher education administration. Her compliance responsibilities include staying up to date on changes in state and federal regulations that may affect her institution, communicating with state regula regulators, and keeping record of status of each state. Additionally, she's responsible for applying for and maintaining authorization across the states and being a resource for chairs, directors, and office managers regarding compliance. She's taken advantage of personal growth opportunities provided by WCET SAN, such as the 2016 Advanced Topics Workshop, and was recently able to present um, Mount St. Mary University um, at the 2018 NASAPS meeting in Portland. She's looking forward to future growth and development opportunities to sharpen her knowledge and skills in the field. And we also have Michelle Starkey. Dr. Michelle Starkey is the Associate Provost and Accreditation Liaison Officer at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. She's a graduate of the Mount, 
Dr. Starkey began working at the university in 1997. Prior to her current position, she served as assistant provost, and before that as co-chair of the Department of Physics, Science, and Mathematics. Physical Science and Mathematics. She earned her doctorate in educational leadership and her master's in mathematics, both from California State University, Long Beach, and has been teaching college level mathematics for over 15 years. She began working in the area of state authorization and compliance in 2014. Her interests include quantitative literacy, math anxiety, and assessment of student learning outcomes. In her current position, Dr. Starkey has led campus assessment, faculty development, and Mount St. Mary University online program. Michelle's an author or co-author of numerous academic papers with a special emphasis on mathematics, education, instruction, techniques, assessment, and achievement. We have very qualified presenters today. I'm very excited to be able to move forward with our folks today so that you can hear the kind of work that they've put in place at their institutions and hopefully make some, bring some takeaways that you can implement at your institution. We're gonna to start today with University of Phoenix. And so I would like to welcome Bridget. Bridget. Hello. Thank you, Cheryl. Very glad to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. We do a lot of work in this area at the university, and I just wanted to run through with everybody just kind of a brief sketch of what we do at University of Phoenix. And for those of you who don't know who we are, we've been around about 40 years, and we've been in the online space since kind of the late 80s, early 90s. And we have done regulatory work pretty much in every state in the country in some form or fashion, either through having a physical campus uh, in a state or offering online instruction into a state. So next slide, please. So the first thing I wanted to share with you all about licensure and disclosures is that it literally takes a village. And I know that you'll hear from the other presenters about how many folks that you have to get involved in this process. And it's not so much that you have to be able to herd cats, as we like to say, but it is about making sure that you have your right go-to people in place. So for us, and you'll, these positions will vary by your institution. So for example, in your office of the provost or wherever your academic folks are, you'll have different types of folks that you'll have different names for them, you know, either academic deans, program deans, department chairs, things of that nature. Um, so those folks are involved. We have a position called a regulatory dean. You may not have that position, but that's equivalent to if you had a compliance director or somebody who's in charge in that particular respect. Also your folks in student services, how all these things get communicated to students, you know, who's actually talking to the students, those types of things. And I'll go into these in a little bit more detail as we kind of walk through the different aspects of our comprehensive method for doing licensure disclosure. So you can get a better idea of who these folks at your institution might be. And one of the other players that is involved is the legal department. And that's my role. So I can speak to this one all day long. Uh, I won't, of course. But I think this is a really important tie-in because I think at a lot of places, folks get assigned to do compliance and they don't have that legal support behind them. And we actually have a group of regulatory attorneys. We have a regulatory practice group that deals specifically with regulatory issues and regulatory compliance. And so we work really closely with the folks on the academic side of the house to make sure that everything is being taken care of and we know exactly what it is that we need to comply with and how we comply with it, and then the implementation of that. The other piece is your marketing folks, and I, I don't know where all of you sit at your requisite institutions, but whoever's in charge of making sure this information gets out externally, we have a marketing compliance manager, someone who makes sure that everything that goes external facing, and this is mostly on the website, social media, that all of that stuff is compliant. All of those pieces of collateral have the right disclosures on there, disclaimers on there, anything that we need to make sure that students are aware of the program, what the program does, 
know, what it's designed to do and what it's designed to prepare them for. Another important person in this mix is your website administrator. And it sounds like a small thing, but it really isn't because I know for our institution, our website is the main driver of traffic. I mean, most students these days, most prospective students and current students, everything is through the website, through an app, through social media. And those are, that, that is the primary way that students reach us. And so when we have that information up, we have to make sure that the person administering that website can make changes to that very easily. And if that doesn't happen, uh, we have issues because that stuff has to be up there. And so we need to make sure that that person is also looped in because all of that is external facing. Okay, next slide. So it takes a lot of people, as I just mentioned, but it, it's a lot of work and it's not impossible to do. So I want to encourage you in that respect. And I know that a lot of folks don't have some of the resources that we do and some of the personnel that we do but it's, it can be done. Um, and, and this is the way that we do it. And I think that these are things that all institutions can implement in some form or fashion. You just kind of have to figure out who it is at your institution that can help you do this. So we have this sort of five pronged philosophy that we, that we go by. And, the, and I'll talk about each of them a little bit individually. And the first one was we decided to design program purpose statements for all of our licensure programs. And I'll show you an example of one of those and what it's designed to do. But this is something that we thought, well, we need to write from the get-go, let students know what this program's for and why they were gonna enroll in it and what will happen if they enroll in this program, you know, what's the projected outcome. Uh, the second thing is that we developed state licensure requirement pages for each licensure program. And this was really mission critical for our licensure program. So we offer education, nursing, and counseling. So these are all programs where state licensure is a key piece. And we have to be able to explain to students what those requirements are, you know, who is going to be you know, overseeing them, you know, where are they gonna get their license from, you know, what's the agency, how do you contact them, what's the process, and our responsibility to make sure that wherever the student is, you know, wherever we're offering that program, that the students know what those requirements are. And this, this was a huge project for us. And for those of you who do this work already, you know that this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to go into every single state and figure out these requirements and then try to be able to explain them to students, again, without kind of overstepping, right? Because ultimately the licensing agency is the one who decides what they're going to do and they can change and they can do whatever it is that they feel is necessary for the oversight of that profession. But at the same time, we have to be able to explain to students you know, who, what that agency does, why they do it, all of those types of things. And so this was a big project. It's a lot of states, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of research, but ultimately it is the best thing for the student. And so we decided that we're gonna do it, we're gonna put it up there, we're gonna make it available, and we're gonna train our folks to make sure that they can speak to these requirements. And that kind of goes into the next two bullets that we have that talk about who it is doing the work. Um, so we have programmatic accreditation and regulatory compliance deemed uh, for each school or college with a licensure program. And those are the folks who are primarily in charge of those state licensure requirements and pages. And they work closely with the individual school or college, with the program deans and the academic deans to make sure that everything that we have up there is correct. But that regulatory dean, is that's their primary function, is to make sure that all those requirements are right and they're updated and they're making sure that they're keeping track of changes. And then we have other folks that we have in specialized teams. Um, we have certain enrollment teams and academic counseling teams and field placement teams for each program. And we make sure that those folks are well aware of their requirements and can speak to their requirements. And again, in a little bit, I will get to kind of how we do that and what we do for those folks to train them. 
Uh, but it, we found that it works very, very well to have a smaller number of folks who know the programs very, very well, so they can answer whatever questions uh, students have. And then again, the final bullet is making sure that you have collaboration with your legal services. Um, we do this very well. Um, we didn't have a regulatory dean position up until, I would want to say, three or four years ago. And the university made the decision to go ahead and create that position to kind of be the liaison between the legal department and the academics. And it's, and it's worked out very well. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that works in real life, because all these things look really great right on paper and it's a great plan, but to actually implement them and get them to work correctly uh, is, is a whole nother game. Next slide, please. Okay, so first thing we did was we asked the colleges to develop these program purpose statements. And these statements are designed to inform students of several things. And I have the four things listed there. And so you can see there's an example of one below. This is the one that we use for our BSED program. And all four of those elements are somewhere in this paragraph. So the first thing we want to tell folks is enrollment eligibility. You know, what credential, if any, do you need to enroll? Um, because sometimes a student can enroll in a program unless they have a specific credential. Uh, for example, right, if you're, if you're running an RN to BSN, your student has to be a licensed nurse or they can't enroll in the program. So they need to kind of know that ahead of time. <laughs> and lots of things that we think are understood are not. So we have to be very clear about that. Uh, the second thing is about educational preparation. Um, you know, what the student's going to learn. Like, what is this program educationally preparing the student to do? Also, if there's any field experience requirements, uh, you know, what the student has to do in addition to their coursework. And then the fourth thing is about licensure exam preparation. You know, what type of license or certification is this student going to be prepared to obtain upon completion of the program? So I gave you the little example there, and I have links in our uh, PowerPoint that you all can go to and, and check out. But you can, at any time, uh, you can go onto our website to any of the licensure programs, and you can see these statements there. And these have really been a good exercise for both the college um, and for the regulatory dean and for the legal department. And it's really, you, you're really forcing your academic folks to really explain the program, what it is, what it does, um, and, and what the outcome is. Next slide. Okay, so our state licensure pages, this is a screenshot of what the actual page looks like. So when I was talking earlier about making sure that you have every state covered, you have to have every state covered and we <laughs> we kind of joke about this but we take these requirements very seriously and what we joke about is look every state that you offer the program in you have to have these requirements up there and if you're not sure or you don't know then you don't go uh, you don't go into a state or offer anything in a state where you are not aware of the required requirements or understand the requirements. If you're offering a program in a specific state, that state has to be on your list. If residents of that state are enrolling in your program, they have got to know and understand you know, who licensed them, how, all of that. So what we've done on our state licensure pages is we've made sure that we have all the states listed. And then it's a little bit hard to see on the slide, but you can see to the right of each state, there's a little plus button. And when you click that button, what will happen is, is everything that you need for Alabama is gonna show up under Alabama. And this is again for our uh, education program. So you'll see, you know, the teacher licensing agency will be listed, their contact information, what the student needs to do, all of those things that are necessary to obtain teacher licensure. And, you know, way back in the day, you used to be able to say, you know, hey student, you know, you can just go to your, licensing agency and and check it out and they'll let you know what the requirements are and those days are long gone and so what we do here is we list all of the licensure requirements because even though we only have 
one piece of that. We have the educational preparation piece. There's a there's several other things, you know, background checks and fingerprinting and content exams and there's all kinds of other requirements. And although we're involved primarily in the educational components of that, there are other things that the students need to be aware of. And if a background check or a fingerprint check, if, if those are going to bounce somebody from licensure, you know, they need to know all those things ahead of time um, before they enroll in a program. So we've made this very comprehensive. And it's very text heavy, so we're working on having it look a little bit nicer. But for now, we are very pleased with how it came out in the sense of it has all the information that needs to be there. We think it's relatively easy for the students to understand. And then this is the information also that our staff can speak to when they're talking to students about the program. The other little link I gave you here is our little video about teacher licensure. And we found that these short visual aids are very helpful to students as well. And this video, it's a couple minutes long, and it really is a very concise summary of what you know, what you need to know about becoming a licensed teacher. And these are great little resources. I don't know, I'm sure, you know, institutions vary by the types of resources they have to produce these types of things. Um, but you can get creative in how you do it. And we found these to be really helpful. I mean, these get a lot of views because um, it's just short and concise and it kind of gives the big picture where the state licensure requirement page really kind of gets into the weeds. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so back to the staff. So to make all of this happen, we have lots of folks that are involved. And those are mostly the ones that I mentioned on, in the first slide. But I wanted to get into a little bit more detail about what each of these folks do. So I mentioned the regulatory dean, which is a relatively new position for us that we created. And I think one of the, one of the best things about this position is that this, one of this person's primary job functions is to make sure that they are monitoring all of these requirements. And my education folks tell me all the time, I'm like, well, states are always changing what they want to do, and they're changing their content exams, or they're changing how students test, or all these types of things. And if you are going to offer the program, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're keeping track of all of these requirements. So the regulatory dean is the point person for those types of changes. And then they work with the legal department when there are legislative or regulatory changes proposed. And we talk about how those changes will impact the program and what we need to do if those changes go through and how we would update all of these things. Because it's nice to have all these things, but you also have to make sure that you're maintaining them. So if anything changes, there's multiple places we have to make sure that we have those changes reflected. The students are getting the most current information. Then the specialized teams that I talked about earlier, they really learn the program requirements in depth. And we have kind of an in-house training that we've developed and we offer to folks who are in these specific areas and they've got to be certified, uh, certified in our term, um, before they're allowed to speak to students. And for example, you know, we have enrollment teams that only talk to folks about education programs, and they have to understand teacher licensure and that process and how all of that works. Uh, same with the nursing students, same with the counseling students. Then the academic counselors, same thing. They're trained on those specific programs to understand the progression requirements, uh, because, you know, all of this just doesn't start at the front end. That's kind of the first step is explaining you know what the program does how it prepares folks but it's a journey for the student and they have to meet requirements along the way um, you know for observation and then student teaching and testing and all of these things happen along the way so it was really important for us to make sure that our academic counselors understood those requirements as well um, we also have folks that do policy analysis we have folks in field placement um, that for example, we'll walk a student through student teaching and the requirements of that. And, you know, we have 
developed forms and other documents that we share with the students and we walk through with them to make sure they understand you know, how many hours, those types of things. Next slide, please. So these are all really great to have, but the key is making sure that they're communicated to the student. And I'm sorry for the pause there. I lost my uh, connection to my laptop here for a second, so hopefully I'll get it back. So on commu about communicating to students, all of these things are great to have, um, but the important thing is, is to make sure that the students are getting them. So as I said earlier, you know, the primary driver is the website. So we make sure that the website has links in multiple places. Each college has a homepage. Each program has a homepage. The links are there. Um, on the state licensure page, as I showed you, the links to earlier, they're all there. Um, they're in the academic catalog. And the academic catalog includes those program purpose statements and links to the state licensure pages. Um, same with the marketing collateral, all student facing materials need to uh, you know, have all of those types of things on there, all, all the disclosures. Um, and then internally, how we communicate to students, because as I said, the licensure process is a journey, so we're communicating with them throughout the entire program. So all those uh, information is in the student handbook. Um, it's on their eCampus site. They have access to, that's what they have access to the catalog and the handbooks and those other types of things. Uh, through the academic counselors, the field placement team, these internal folks are, are always, you know, providing reminders and updates and all these things to students along the way. So I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not over time. I know we're getting close and I don't want to cut into anybody else's time. So that's a brief overview. Um, my contact information is in the slides as well. You can contact me with questions, uh, comments, anytime. Um, the best way to reach me is either email or text. Uh, so, Cheryl, thank you very much for letting us share a little bit about what we do. And I will look forward to taking some questions uh, after Monte Mary. Thank you very much, Bridget. This was great. I appreciate you being very detailed, and I think it gave a lot of information for folks to take back and, and see what they can do within the processes that they're creating at their own institution. So thank you for breaking it down the way you did. That was, that was excellent. Um, we will be able to ask Bridget questions at the end, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenters that are from Mount St. Mary's University. And so we have... Uh, Move the slides first. Uh, we're going to start with Kairis. Uh, so, Kairis, welcome, and uh, we'll let you take it away. Thanks a lot, Cheryl. Um, we're happy to be here and, and able to present this information to everyone. Um, so, we are Mount St. Mary's University. We're a Catholic university. Um, we're a liberal. We're also a liberal arts institution, primarily for women, and we're based in um, Los Angeles, California. Currently, we have um, nine professional licensure track programs, one of which is fully online. You can go ahead and move the slide, Cheryl. So before I get into the agenda, uh, Michelle and I wanted to point out that the way that we organized our presentation was actually by the prompts of the, the Sensational Award um, application. And even though we don't necessarily go into full detail, of course, in this presentation, we wanted um, this to, you know, be a possible tool or resource for those who would um, be applying in the future, which we definitely encourage everyone to do so. So uh, back to the agenda, um, we will be sharing a bit about uh, the background of our professional licensure work. We'll also um, show you where we've placed our disclosure statement and we'll also show um, how we really kept the students in mind and um, when developing these disclosure statements and tried to make our, dis our disclosure statements as easily accessible 
and as easy to understand as possible. Next slide, please. So onto our background of the professional licensure work we've been doing. Um, in early 2017, we formed our compliance team. And this is really a way for us to get ready for um, the then new regs that were published in December 2016 and were due to um, be enforced in July of this year, um, but are now delayed. And so our compliance team is composed of um, of all of our of representatives from all of our professional licensure programs, and also individuals who were or are really key in um, implementing our ideas. As um, Bridget had mentioned earlier, it really takes the village to do all of this work. So, one of the things that um, um, Excuse me, just to just to go back, um, our compliance team includes um, the following types of individuals who who help us put this work forward. Um, it includes our director of fully online programs, um, personnel in charge of admissions, our website, our catalog. Uh, the vice president of enrollment management is also on our team, as well as our state authorization consultant. And so. Uh, what we've been able to accomplish as a team, one of the things is we developed a policy for professional licensure disclosure. And in this policy, we explain our centralized approval process where all of the disclosures go um, are reviewed and approved by the provost office. We also list the required components of the, of the disclosures within the policy, and we indicate that there is an annual review process of all of the uh, disclosure information as well as where to place um, all of these disclosures. And so, as you may know, um, though the professional licensure component of the delayed federal regulations apply to online professional licensure programs, um, all of the uh, programs are all programs are actually subject to misrepresentation rules. So even though we have only one fully online professional licensure program, um, which actually would have made our lives a lot easier, um, we, however, uh, still decided to apply the our policy, which is pretty much based, um, based on the, the regulations, to both online and on-ground professional licensure programs we have. Um, and we really did this because uh, we were able to put the students um, kind of look through the lens of our of our students and realize that you know the majority of our students in particular um, are first generation students. So if it is difficult for us, and we've had. Um, you know, this has been brought up before, if it's difficult for us as professionals to really dive into um, all of these resources and um, decipher them and interpret them, then how much more difficult would it be for the student to actually um, find these resources and interpret them appropriately? So um, with that understanding, we eventually just collectively excuse me, collectively um, realized that this was just the right thing to do and this is what we wanted to move forward with. And so currently we're still in the process of conducting um, state-specific research for our, our, our on-ground uh, professional licensure programs. Next slide, please. So visibility, um, when we initially when we started um, this process, we realized that there were three populations of students that we had to disclose this information to. And those were prospective students, our applicants, and current students. Um, and so in trying to figure out where to actually place these disclosures, we always kept the students in each of these populations in mind. And we asked, you know, what do we, what do they look at? Um, where do they look? which places are they exposed to, um, 
what materials are they exposed to, et cetera. And so with that in mind, we decided to diversify the locations and kind of cast a wide net and create multiple possible points of contact with this information, hoping that, you know, they'll go to at least one location and see this information. Um, and you'll see that there are some of these locations that span across all of our populations, such as our website. Um, and there's multiple places on our website that the students um, or that we have placed our disclosure statements and information in. Um, there's also several locations that are specific to the actual population um, and where we know for sure that, you know, students in some of these, these um, populations will um, come in contact with these disclosures. For example, our applicants, um, for those applicants who eventually enroll into the institution, they're exposed to the program disclosures and our, um, or the disclosures in general um, about three times before even enrolling into the institution through our application process, through the admittance letter and um, the enrollment agreement. And for our current students, you know, we have our advising sessions and our advising sessions are, are mandatory every semester. Um, and these students, the disclosure information is, is available to them there, which Michelle will actually touch on um, next. And she'll give you a few more examples of these locations too. Okay. Um, hi everyone, this is Michelle now speaking. Can you go to the next slide, please, Cheryl? All right, so um, I'm gonna be highlighting some of the instances that Carice mentioned on the previous slide. And first of all, our website. This, of course, is where the general public, prospective students, even current students may go, and so we wanna make sure the disclosure statements are located on our website. Um, here, we're highlighting our state authorization and professional licensure page in particular where the disclosure statements are, but they also appear on program specific pages as well. Um, and so we do have this um, in less than three clicks, they can get to this page here that we have a snippet of. They, um, there you can see there's a paragraph about professional licensure. And then if the student scrolls down farther or there's also a hyperlink there in that paragraph, they can see the specific um, section. There's a section on disclosures and a button that will um, give them all of the professional licensure program disclosures. All of the program specific ones will come up when they get on that button there. Um, they can also access this page directly if you know or any of you want to go look at it. It is just msmu.edu slash state authorization and it will take you directly to this page. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, so this next example shows how the applicants come in contact with disclosure statements during their application process. So we do have an online application, and we were able to um, give our coders like a flow chart, you know, when a student clicks on this program, then make sure this disclosure comes up. Um, and so here is a case, an example of someone who said they were interested in the counseling psychology program. And this disclosure screen pops up and the student has to click the box there, verifying they've read the disclosure and then click continue in order to go on. And so this is a time where we actually collect proof that the students have seen the disclosure. So now we know they've actually seen it because they had to make two clicks to go on. Um, and there are a couple other times where we collect proof as well. Um, one is the, uh, or second one is the enrollment agreement that Kay Reese mentioned earlier. So our enrollment agreement, and I'm assuming all of you are familiar with those, but just in case, an enrollment agreement has basically all of the disclosures for a student 
Um, they might talk about the tuition that needs to be paid. Um, ours also includes our civility policy. We call it the Athenian promise. Um, all the kinds of things that you need to make sure they are aware of before they officially become a student. And so they're customized, the enrollment agreements are customized specifically to that student in their program. You know, if they're an online student, they're going to get information about um, distance education policies. If they're an on-ground student, then they get other information. So anyway, we're able to collect that as proof too because the student has to initial each um, disclosure statement and then sign and return that enrollment agreement. And then a third way that we collect proof is, um, if we go to the next slide, is with our current students. We have um, mandatory advising, as Kay Reese mentioned. And so before they're allowed to register for their courses each term, they must meet with their advisor. There's a hold on their account, and only their advisor can lift that hold. And so we have trained all of the advisors that work in our professional licensure programs. There are faculty advisors. Some programs do have uh, other staff advisors too. But they're all trained to talk with the students and ask them specifically where they plan to practice. Do they plan to practice in California or in another state? And if they say that they're interested in possibly another state or two, then we they do talk with them and give them information about any possible additional requirements that may be needed by those states. And then uh, this document is this acknowledgement form here is a way to document and have proof that we've actually had this discussion. Um, the advisors and the student are instructed to attach to this acknowledgement form the resources that they reviewed and discussed and then an explicit list of the additional requirements that would be needed for the state or states that they discussed. And all, the instructions are on the second page, which we didn't show you here, but it also then says that the department is to maintain a copy of this, the student is to be given a copy of this, and then we also put a, uh, send a copy to the registrar's office who saves it in the student's file. And this is all done electronically, so we can also gather electronic signatures if, um, say, we have online students doing these. Um, we use Adobe Sign to get electronic signatures. And then the next slide, please. Okay, so when we went to start writing our disclosure statements, kind of similar to the program purpose statements that Bridget talked about, um, we really wanted to think about what needs to go into these disclosure statements. We were thinking not only the departments who had to write these disclosure statements, they, they were asking for guidance, but also we were thinking about the students and when they read them, they need to be able to understand them. So we wanted them to be clear, concise, but have all the information needed as well. So we um, came up with a list of components, like what needs to go in a disclosure statement, and we put that into our policy there. And we also require them, as Kay Reese mentioned, to be approved through the provost office, so we have the centralized approval. The web manager knows this, he's on our compliance team, so he knows that if a department asks for one of the disclosure statements to be changed, he knows to make sure they have approval of the provost office first. And then, of course, we require them to um, review these annually. You can see this is a general disclosure statement that we have on our webpage, just saying that our professional licensure programs prepare students for license in the state of California. If they wish to practice in another state, they may or may not have additional requirements to complete. And then they can go to program-specific ones, too. Um, this particular screen is just a screenshot, so those links don't work. But if you want to access them, you can access it through that web page that I mentioned earlier, the msmu.edu slash state authorization, and go down to the disclosure section. And so we do want to make sure the links are working and that the information is correct. So we do require that annual review. And the next slide, we share a couple program specific disclosures here, one for nursing, and one for psychology, who actually has two different professional licensure programs that they offer. And as you can see, we've noted that we're in the process of researching professional licensure requirements in other states. Our goal is to eventually um, link out here to a document 
um, that has the additional requirements by state. The research is currently being done in, in two different ways. Um, for the online program, which we only have one really right now, they have to do the research for all of the states. So they have a document they're working with, they're, they're going through and verifying and, and double checking um, that information. But the other programs who are on ground, they uh, last year they gave a survey out to all of their students and asked them which, you know, where do they plan to practice if it's not California? And they collected that list of states. And for example, I know psychology, they came up with a list of seven states. And so we started doing research. That's where we focused our research or on those states. And then each year when they uh, meet in the advising sessions, the advisors note any states that the students talk about. If there's any new states, then we do the research then for that. And they keep adding to the research as students happen to bring up the states they're interested in. And so theirs is a little slower process. It's not quite as on onerous on them. And then lastly here, we just wanted to share the next slide. We want to share our policy that we created. And so this slide here does have a link that goes to our policy document um, so you can access that and it like as we mentioned before it goes over the components which must be in each disclosure statement goes over how the statements are approved how often they need to be reviewed and where they are required to pl publish those statements and so that's all that we have to share at this time thank you very much well, thank you very much, Michelle and Carice. Uh, it, it's wonderful for us to be able to hear from two institutions that are, are fairly different. We have a fairly small institution and a fairly large institution to be able to contrast how the processes are and, and be able to uh, see things that are uh, common in both institutions, regardless of size. So we know that things can be uh, workable at our institutions, and you all have explained that very well. Um, right now, I'd like to be able to take questions from the uh, question section. You all can find that in your um, your dashboard. There's a question section. If you'd like to ask questions, if you could just post them in there, and we'll we'll share those with our presenters. Well, while we're waiting, uh, I'm not seeing questions yet, um, but what I, I'd like to share with you all is that um, these Sensational Awards, you know, they, for those that aren't aware, uh, these were nominations. They were submitted last, late last spring, early summer, and they were reviewed by um, a, a committee who, um, who reviewed their members from institutions and um, some other consultants who reviewed the nominations and determined who um, would be our winners for this year. So we're really pleased that, you know, they were very, de the um, nominations were reviewed very thoroughly and um, a lot of good thought was brought into uh, making determinations of award winners. And so we were very pleased to be able to share the awards uh, with our folks back in um, Portland. We were able to share the, uh, we were able to present the awards to them. Unfortunately, we were missing our friend from University of Louisville. So we're hoping to uh, present to her in, um, at NASAPS this, this spring. But I just wanted to say congratulations to Mount St. Mary's and to University of Phoenix for the great work that you have done. I think that you all were just so clear that I'm just not really seeing any any questions. Um, Dan, do you have any questions? Or um, if you have some questions that have been asked of you in, in, in the past, um, Bridget or Carice or Michelle, if you'd like to um, address that, you we have the time to do that today. One question that, that sometimes comes up is, um, what procedures do you either of you have for keeping this this updated, or or do you have some idea? I mean, you, you know what I mean. Going moving forward, keeping everything current. How do you how do you do that? What about when a big change comes up? Um, this is Michelle. We have the compliance team is um, is our a space where we make sure that we keep them updated. And so we, um, you know, by keeping in contact with SAN here and NASAPS and everything else that we might need, we uh, we hear when there are changes that are being made or new things coming up. And so we do go through the compliance team, make sure they're aware of that. 
But then also we do have that annual review where we're asking them um, to by we when we picked a date October 1st is the date they have to do it by to give them a little bit of time at the beginning of the year if they're off during the summer to um, to double check that the links work and to, and to see that for all the different states that they have information for research done that they're still correct that nothing's been updated um, so far it we think that that will be a fairly easy process compared to the actual research process um, but so far we haven't um, really had to do that yet. Um, so we'll, we'll have to come up with a process to make sure that um, it doesn't get too onerous. Thank you. We, we've had uh, a few folks be able to share some questions and this one is for Kiris. Are you able to share your professional licensure policy with us? Um, yes, so at the, our final slide, um, there's a link to the policy um, document there, and that's, you right know, there. positioned on the website. Yeah, right there. There it is at the bottom. Um, so you can click on that link anytime and um, have our policy um, document. Wonderful. And this slide deck will be available on the SAN website by about the end of the week. Um, everything will be loaded there. Um, you can listen to the recording. You can review the slides and um, check it through to see the um, the links that you can uh, find within the the PowerPoint presentations. Thank you very much. We also have um, uh, another question. This one's for Michelle. Does your compliance team work with only state authorization and professional licensure, or is it the university's general compliance team dealing with all compliance topics? No, right now it is just state authorization and professional licensure compliance. So, um, yeah, there's other things like for GDPR and other financial aid compliance issues that are being handled by other um, that don't fall into the provost um, purview there for to be in charge of it, I guess, the provost office. Um, but we'll add things in as needed that come up. Great. Uh, we had a question that's just more in general um, to all of us, I think, is licensure information a regulatory requirement yet or more of a best practice? And I think that um, this question depends uh, on a few things. Um, if you are a, a participant, if you're an institution that participates in SARA, um, sharing regulatory information uh, about licensure um, is a part of the requirements of SARA to share the licensure information that is item number 10 that was part of your application in section 5.2 of the SARA manual, um, as well as there's a federal regulation for misrepresentation that addresses licensure information to students, so you may want to review that as well. Um, Do anybody have any additional thoughts they'd wish to share about, um, about the requirement of a licensure information to students? Hi, um, well, yeah, according so oh, go ahead. I was saying, this is Bridget again, and for us, there's multiple requirements right at multiple levels, and I think that's why it's helpful too to have a legal person if they're available to you to help you through that. Because as Cheryl said, right, there's the federal requirement, there's there's a SARA requirement, but then if you're operating in a state, you may have additional state requirements. Uh, for example, you know, we still have ground locations in Texas and Nevada and California and a few other states. And so you also have to be aware there's a whole other layer on top of that that you have to meet. And so in order to make sure that you're really doing right by the student and protecting the institution, you really need to be disclosing them regardless um, because it's just the right thing to do. Um, but to help somebody help, you know, get you to navigate through all those different requirements, because there may be something out there that you're not aware of if you haven't done it before, just to make sure that you <clears throat> that you can check in with someone and make sure, okay, yes, we're meeting federal, uh, we're meeting SARA, if we're participating, and if we're not participating in SARA, you know, what are the other requirements that we may have to meet state by state? Perfect. Thank you. Michelle, did you have something to add? No, I was going to talk about the misrepresentation rule, which applies to every program, which is similar to what Bridget was saying, though, that yep. you really do. It's just to be right, do right by the student and protect your university. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that you all reinforce that. Um, and just to to others that may have that same question that are participants on our uh, webcast today, you can find some of that information about why it's important to comply um, and provide licensure information on the SAN website. So you can find a variety of um, uh, write-ups about it in the Frontiers blogs, and you can find those in the resource section of the SAN website. Um, the only other comment that we have today is uh, from our friend Sherry Miller. She congratulates all three of you um, for your very informative, and she says congratulations on your award. So we thank Sherry for that, and uh, we we share that um, congratulations to you all as well. Um, any any final comments before I share some information about SAN and WCET? Anything else from that you all would like to share? That's fine. You guys yeah. shared so much uh, wonderful information today. Bridget, you were about to say something. I would say thank you for the opportunity to present. It was great. Well, we were very glad to have you. Um, you can find the information um, about our presenters today um, when you review the, the slides. Their um, email addresses are there. Uh, I want to share a little bit more about WCET and SAN. These are some links that you can look uh, for more information about what our organization has to offer um, and uh, to share the membership link with those that you know that maybe you're not a member of SAN, but I think that uh, sharing with you that there are a lot of resources on the same SAN website is, is a helpful piece. Uh, and then coming up, I'd like to just uh, share one more time that there is a SAN Basics Workshop that will be in March in the Washington, D.C. area. It's in Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from Washington, D.C. It's actually right across from Georgetown. We'll be using the UVA Darden Sands Family Ground Center, and the hotel we'll be using is the Keybridge Marriott. Registration is open now, and you can go to this link here or go directly to the website under um, events. And uh, also, under resources, our past webinars are available there. Uh, those of you that are members will have login capability to be able to see all webinars, but we do uh, hold uh, some of our webinars um, open to the whole public, and the sensational webinars will be open to the public, as are our webinars in uh, regarding Sarah. So if you have folks that are wanting to know information about Sarah, those will be made to the public as well. We're very pleased that uh, we have um, supporting members. These are our supporting members for WCET, Colorado State University, Cooley, uh, Michigan State University, Lone Star College System, University of Missouri, Columbia, Mizzou Online, University of North Texas. And then we also have our annual sponsors who uh, work with us throughout the year. So we're very grateful to them as well. Thank you very much for you all being here today. And I hope that you are able to gain um, some insight into how two institutions are doing this good work. And I hope you'll be back with us in January. We'll be putting out that date very soon for the other uh, Sensational Award winners and the good work that they shared. So I hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll be talking with you very soon. Thank you again to our presenters. Take care.